Hi, I'm Ed Begley, and I just talked to Kara, and it was quite a motivating experience for me, and it will be for you. Listen to what she has to say. There are many words of wisdom. Thank you, Kara. Hi friends, it's Kara. Welcome back to Really Famous. Today I'm talking to Ed Begley Jr., the one-of-a-kind actor and one of the original environmental activists. You may have seen him recently on Better Call Saul. He played Cliff Main or on Young Sheldon where he was Dr. Linkletter. Maybe when you think of Ed, it's Victor Ehrlich, you see, from St. Elsewhere. Well, now you're about to get to know Ed Begley Jr. in real life. And he is most definitely one of a kind. And his life has been quite something. He's had ups and downs of all sorts, including countless adventures with Hollywood icons, years of addiction, and all kinds of escapades and dangerous situations he got himself into. He talks about a lot of them in his new memoir, To the Temple of Tranquility and Step on It. And we analyze his choices, insights, and even his lies here today. We taped this talk at the Voice Studio Soundbox LA. And at the end of today's talk with Ed, I'm sharing a short, fun chat that I had with Tim Friedlander, the owner of the studio and a veteran voice actor, about all kinds of fun dish on what exactly goes on behind the scenes of some of our favorite TV shows, films, and video games. We talk about dubbing famous actors' voices, being the voice of political ads, being the voice of a video game. And Tim also shares a philosophical gem that voice actors use. And now as a therapist, I am definitely adopting into my everyday practice and advice. And we're sharing it with you. So look forward to that. And first will come my chat with Ed. But before that, a word from our sponsors. All right, let me make sure my phone is off too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I am going to take my phone out first in a minute because I have a list of things that... Sure, do it whenever you not need. Not a list of questions because I don't work that way. I just personally like to get to know you. I like that a lot. So it's Conversation. A, yes. Just like, kind of like your book you just wrote. Yep, thank you. You just, it seemed like you had said that you had somebody else who was going to write it for you. Yes, but then you started writing down notes for that person? Yeah, there was never an actual person by name or in any way. It was just suggested that I might, it might be easier for me if I had a ghostwriter. So I said, okay, let me think about it. I'm not sure if I'm ready to write a memoir or even have a ghostwriter. Let me think about it. My daughter started recording on her smartphone. And then I started to take notes when she wasn't available. I went, I'm not giving this to anyone, including my daughter. I like it so much, the process of writing it. I, I want to do it all myself. And I had a ball. That's great, because it seems like you had a ball, and it seems very much, I don't know you personally until now, but it seems like I have a sense of you from the book. Oh, Not nice. just what you're writing about, but from your style of just writing the book as you're thinking it. Right. That's what I hope for, and I'm glad you felt it turned out that way. I would say success on that. Bless you. It's pronounced Kara, right? It is. Thank you, Kara. So we're talking about your book right now that I just finished reading a few days ago. Bless you. And it was an absolute pleasure. You're so nice to say that. Thank you, Kara. So your book is called To the Temple of Tranquility and Step on It. And that's a line actually uttered by my dear friend Dick Stahl, a wonderful actor, Richard Stahl or Dick Stahl. It was not a line he said on stage with a committee or any of those improv groups, not a line he said in a TV show or movie. He said it in life. He was supposed to go. Many of us became enamored with a spiritual path after the Beatles met the Maharishi. So we all tried different ways to connect with things like that. And he booked a very type A kind of a trip, you know, to get to this Temple of Tranquility there somewhere in Indonesia, I believe. And he had a flight and another flight and a merchant marine vessel, a berth on that. And everything went wrong, as things sometimes do. He missed the flight, you know, in Hawaii, the connection. So then it was he was late getting to the Philippines. Then it, the, there wasn't another merchant marine vessel for a week. And then monsoon season started. And by the time he ran up the uh, dock and got into a taxi, he said to the taxi driver, the Temple of Tranquility, and step on it. 
and the taxi driver found it quite amusing. He didn't want to spoil his tip, so he tried to keep it quiet but couldn't. And Dick started to laugh, and it was, of course, a wonderful, ironic thing. And I went, if I ever write a book, that's going to be the title. Uh Uh-huh. Perfect. Because believe me, I tried to rush serenity in many different ways, all of them foolish. What were some of those ways? I tried to at first, the the mere idea of rushing serenity is not the way it works. You have to find it. You have to realize you don't have to get enlightened. You are enlightened already. Kara's enlightened sitting in that chair if you just let it be, and so am I. And also the idea of then trying to find a spiritual path and to get serenity out of a bottle of Stolichnaya, that's probably not the best way to have sustainable serenity. You can get someone who can feel quite serene having a, a bottle of uh, Stoli or to have a couple lines of some drugs or what have you. can feel briefly okay, but in the long run, it's a net loss for me. Maybe so there are people out there that don't have that experience. Mine is it's a big, big, very quantifiable net loss to try to find serenity in that way. So I quit that too. Yeah. I mean, you had a lot of years of that. I did. 71 through 78, I drank a quart of vodka every day and I operated a vehicle. So I wouldn't recommend that to any young people listening. Yeah. So you started drinking like what age? I started before the drinking, I started stealing the pills out of my dad's medicine chest. And uh, he wasn't really taking them because he was sober for years. The doctor said, here, take these if you can't sleep. And he went, I don't want to start taking pills. So he didn't. Mm -hmm. So I got away with it for a while, just taking one here, a second one there. And that was my first addiction was that. And then it became pot. And then finally, after he passed away in 71, I kind of felt, well, I should keep up the alcoholic you know, side of the Irish family and, and start drinking. It seems quite romantic. I want to be like Richard Burton and Peter O'Toole and all those wonderful British actors and Tony Hopkins. They get good and drunk. Oliver Reed, yeah, that's what I want to do. If I get drunk, I'll be a wonderful actor. So I started drinking in hopes of improving my acting game. And that doesn't quite work that way either. And so... Uh, I, I drank a good deal of liquor in a relatively short period of time, a lifetime's amount of it, but I just drank it in about seven or eight years. Mm, that's a lot. And so, and you started young and you kept going. And it's pretty amazing that you made it. Amazing. Amazing. I didn't get, I did get arrested more than once, but I never really spent any jail time. I didn't get arrested for being under the influence, I don't think ever. I got arrested for an eagle, illegal left turn or what have you. But the cops back then were very palsy walsy about certain things, and drinking was one of them. There are so many stories in your, in your book. So you've had a very full life, like full to the max. I'll say. I mean, it's, a, it's like a who's who of... Hollywood. You have stories about everybody. I have a whole list of them that I was going to bring out, and I may bring out soon because there are a few of them that I would like you to share also. Sure. But it's like you're meeting this one and that one and the Beatles and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Marlon Brando and Jack Nicholson and just so many people, and you're in these situations with them in real life. It's not necessarily work situations. Right. So what is the deal? Like, How did you meet this many people? Is it Was it because of your father initially? or Because he was famous and like, how did all this happen? It was exactly that. It was, I'm like Zelig or Chauncey Gardner or Forrest Gump. I'm in the right place at the right time. And nobody knows quite how I got there, including me. But I, you know, I had a, a free pass. I had a backstage pass. I was fully laminated from birth because of the nature of my father. He'd won an Academy Award. He was in 12 Angry Men. He was a very well-respected actor in films and TV and, and films and on stage on Broadway. So people go, oh, Ed Begley's son, you know. I kind of got a, a free free pass without ever asking for it. I had won the lottery, and I didn't even buy a ticket. I had no idea. For a while, I was even somewhat ingrate. I was something of an ingrate because I thought, why am I not getting the parts in a timely manner that I deserve? I want to work on Gunsmoke, and I want to work on Perry Mason, and I want to work on, you know, Wagon Train, Dad, get me a series for God's sake. I'm sure my father can pick up the phone and they'll hire me for a TV series. It doesn't work like that at all. My father didn't have the power to do that, number one. Number two, I wouldn't have appreciated had he done that. So So back off, though. Did you actually ask him to get you these parts? No, no. Thank God I would have gotten slapped, I'm sure. Something else, I would have had some form of corporal punishment or otherwise because uh, it was absurd. But I I realized years later that I definitely thought it. 
I really, you know, I had it all wrong. Wake me when I'm famous, I think, was the basic mantra uh-huh. that I had going on in the back of my head. But that's not the way to do it. I finally started to study, and then I began to work as an actor. I still so, hadn't studied enough, but I began. So you, um, you wanted to have, you wanted to follow in his footsteps. I did very much so. I think if he had been a plumber, I'd be fitting pipe now. Interesting. Okay, yeah. why? Just because he was so large and powerful and mighty and. Back then, you know, we'd go to a men's club called the Lambs Club, and all that was just swell in 1950-whatever when I first started to take notice of the, the men's club called the Lambs Club. I thought that was just fine. Looking back at the pictures now, there are no people of color back there at all in that period. There no women were allowed to be members back then. It was just crazy. You know, white privilege seemed just fine by me because I was a recipient of it. But I didn't. we didn't know the term back then. It was just the way things work. You get stopped by the... You know, the sheriff's department, L.A. County Sheriff's Department, Christmas Eve, you know, just hammered drunk and on other medications. You know, just drive drive safe going home, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Not so much for the guys that I hit. One of the guys, four African-American guys that I hit and raked along the right side of their car. I don't think it would have gone down the same if the roles had been reversed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a different era. And, uh, I mean, that's that's interesting to look back on now. You didn't realize it then. It wasn't really brought the term white privilege wasn't a thing. No, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I thought I was unlucky. People compare me to my dad. Why did they compare me to my father? I'm different than him. And why am I not getting the parts that I should be getting? I should be getting some of these good parts without ever really doing the hard work. I studied a bit, but I was more interested in partying, going to Tana's and driving drunk. So you wanted that lifestyle more than... Than to do the work, yes. I didn't... When I finally started doing the work, then I started to get better parts, of course. But prior to that, I, but you know, I was I had bad decision making back then because I was high from really 1965 a lot of the time to 1971, then high all the time through 78, and then finally 79 when I finally quit everything. So were you self medicating in some way? Do you think were you trying to ease whatever no suffering? question? Oh, no question. Yeah, and I think I really believe that. Drugs and alcohol saved me before it killed me because I was such a wreck emotionally about many different things. Okay, what what things? Well, like finding out that my mother was my mother. You okay. know, when Wait I got the minute. birth certificate in the first chapter. Okay. My father gives me the birth certificate, and I could show it to you now if I had it in my pocket. It's blank under the mother's name. Mother, there's nothing there because it was a bit of a scandal because my father had not one but two children with a woman that was not at all his wife a page at NBC he had taken up with. And I have no idea what the agreement was. My birth mother, Sandy, knew about my real, my adoptive mother, I suppose, uh, my stepmother. I don't think if they, I don't know if, I know they knew about each other. I don't know what they knew, what the agreement was. Ed's going to have babies with this other woman. Are you cool with that or what? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. They Mm -hmm. hit it. And my dad just showed up with two babies that kind of looked like him. You know, such things happened back in that day because, you know, certain people were all powerful. Right. So what? Okay, that's yes, because that's how you open your book. Yeah. And it's really such a large part of I would think like what 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 were you what were you thinking to yourself? Because it wasn't something you were talking about. Right. Like just like you said, you weren't sure what the arrangement was. So. What were the emotional, what were you thinking inside of yourself at that time? I was thinking part of me was in a great deal of real pain about it, about what that meant and how did I not know that that woman that I loved and saw several times a year was my mother? How did I miss that clue? You know, Bruce Bruce Willis is dead throughout the whole movie. Rosebud was a sled. You know, I mean, I kind of missed, you know. Hey, you're giving away all the spoilers here. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I, I just I didn't quite get what was going on though it was there right in front of me and so uh, I medicated because of that but I also when I really began began to dig deeper into it I kind of liked the victim mode you know I found that my mom wasn't my mom and I found a body in my trash and oh my god I got evicted from my place and they, I had to you know, go on the road and live out of my jeep and all this victim stuff I kind of I loved it because it gave me another reason to drink. Well, you know what? I told Eddie to stop drinking, but I'm going to get off his case because if anybody's got something to drink about, it's him. 
The accident so, the same day, he got stabbed waiting for a bus at Western Imperial. Same day, a year later, he had his femur broken, found a body in the trash, X, Y, Z, all this different stuff where I was the victim. I, I reveled in it, I think. When did you realize that you reveled in it? When I got sober, finally, when I was 30. So did you, what did that come from? Did that come from, like, the program or therapy or a lot of like self-reflection? How did you come to these realizations about yourself? Mostly self-reflection. I thought about it. I finally was not as clouded over. I was not, you know, didn't have that cloud. That's the problem with drugs and alcohol. I started doing that stuff when I was almost 16. And when you do that, when you start numbing the pain, you also numb the good feelings too. You numb to good and bad experiences, so you stop growing. If you can't feel what hot or cold is, you're not gonna. You're gonna get burned all the time. So I stopped growing. So when I finally got sober in 1979, I was really 16 or 17 years old mm, emotionally. emotionally. Mm. Yeah. So I began to think about things, and then I did therapy briefly. Really, I got so much out of it so quickly, I didn't feel the need to do it forever. You know, I did it for a short period of time and got a tremendous amount. And I realized if I stayed sober and didn't do that other kind of bad behavior, other addictive things like gambling, you know, and philandering and stuff like that, that ultimately made me as unhappy as it would make my wife or girlfriend, you know, at the time. Mm -hmm. So if I stopped doing that, I wouldn't be in pain anymore because I was, it was bad even for the perpetrator was bad. I felt shitty all the time because I was living a lie. Right, right. Okay, so were you, when you were working, okay, so let's put me in, in the time frame of St. Elsewhere. Yeah. So I have to go to that first because. It was a big job, my first really great, great job. And I loved that show. I used to watch with my dad. Oh, wow. And it was like, it's one of our all-time favorites. Yeah, mine so, too. Right? Just as a spectator. Now, forget that I'm in it. So I would have watched it even if I wasn't in it. I love that show. Okay. And so you also have an interesting story that I would love for you to share, if you don't mind sharing it again, about the shirt, the Hawaiian shirt. Oh, yeah. I'll definitely tell that okay. story. And a little preview story to it that I think you'll like too. I did not go in an audition for the role of Dr. Victor Ehrlich. I auditioned for Dr. Peter White. Ehrlich was a character unknown to me. The role of Dr. Peter White was a regular. I auditioned for it, and I didn't get it. Terrence Knox got it. I'd never heard of him. Turns out he was very good in the part, just because I never heard of him. He was a fine actor and deserved the part. They threw me a bone, gave me a line, a two-line part, a part that had literally two lines in the pilot script. They said, we're going to maybe put some more in. We'd love to have you in our show. I'm sorry it's not the, the, the role of the of Peter White, the regular role. So I said, well, I'll take it. You know, maybe something will happen. Season two, Dr. Peter White gets shot in the balls and then in the stomach because he turned out to be the hospital rapist. That's season two. I was in all of the episodes of the show, save one where they go back in time, but, uh, you know, a flashback episode. But I was in every other episode. It was one of the major, epi one of the major characters in the show was Dr. Victor Ehrlich. So once again, I didn't get what I wanted, and what I got was much better than what I ever had wanted. Yeah, I think that's super common also in life. If you it look is. at it that way also, yeah, you could, you have the ability later to be like, you know what? It was a good thing I didn't get that. It's a good Very thing. Good. Because if I had, I would be, who knows what my next job would be. Every single thing that happened to me, all of it, that, that night on Sunset Boulevard hitting the cars, you know, all the other horrible things that happened, the body in the trash, all of it, not getting the part. It was all essential so that I'd be sitting here in this chair with you this moment. Here it comes, this one. Where we have everything that we need. Right we now. can actually be in the now, this moment. This is it, as Alan Watts so wisely said. This is it. Right now, here it comes again, this one. That's all you get. We both know that that past happened just a few moments ago when I snapped before. We know that the future is going to happen again, and you plan for it as best you can. But don't you don't spend too much time in the past or the pre or the future. You live in the present and what a life it can be. 
Okay. Yes, 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 and yes. But I can't let two things go. You didn't tell the story yet. I still need the Hawaiian shirt oh, story. Oh, the Hawaiian, that's right. And then that's... we're also going to, because you mentioned it a few times, the dead body in your garbage can, well, you'll have to explain that soon. I'll tell that one okay, as well. Okay, let's, so let's go back to St. Elsewhere. And before we jump to the next one, I do need to sit in St. Elsewhere for a moment. So let's start okay, we'll with the story. We'll stay there at St. Elsewhere for a while. So I get this two-line part that right away, by the time they do the next draft, the blue draft of the gl- the green draft, the subsequent versions of the script, they've given me more lines. Now I have like four or five lines, which is pretty good in a pilot like that. Four or five lines is a part. It's not a regular yet. You know, I'm just in the, an episode, but it looks like there might be more in the second or third episode. And I won't jump ahead in the story. I'll just tell you, I finally okay. go in, having gotten this bonus, not one or two, but I think four lines in the pilot of St. Elsewhere, you have to go in for your wardrobe fitting. So I go in for the wardrobe fitting, and wardrobe fittings are essential. You always learn a lot about the character, and you also learn some key things like, oh, we're not shooting that scene tomorrow as planned. We're shooting it next week. We're not shooting it out in the valley where we planned. we got to go to Barstow because that's got the right kind of junkyard we need to... So you learn some important things about the character and about your life and schedule. And such was the case when I met Bob Moore, the guy that was a wardrobe designer, uh, the costume designer for St. Elsewhere. He had some different lab coats for me to try on and some kind of normal clothes that went underneath it, normal slacks and what have you, and some shirts. And then he had some Hawaiian shirts. I went, who are those for? Is that for our show too? He said, yeah, they're actually for your character. Oh, uh, I'm not sure I get what's with the Hawaiian shirt. He said, well, your character's from California. I hadn't heard that. I didn't know that. So I learned my characters from California. This guy, the wardrobe, he's a department head, wardrobe department. He wants to try Hawaiian shirts. I give him the same courtesy I would afford any director, producer, writer. Let's try whatever you like. You're a creative person in charge of a department. Uh, let's, let's try it. So we go over with a Hawaiian shirt on me and the pants not quite hemmed. They're kind of waiting to be hemmed out the bottom. And I go in and I meet Mark Tinker, John Macius and Josh Brand and John Falsey. They're all there and they're kind of, Josh and John are like, oh, Hawaiian shirt, really? Okay, you know, maybe, let me, and Macius goes, you know, I, I think, think it's okay and Mark Tinker seems to be okay and then Bruce Paltrow comes in. All right, so Bruce Paltrow, can we just set it up for people who maybe don't even know who he is? Oh, I'm going to tell you who okay, he is. Okay, good. Bruce Paltrow comes in and the room gets very still because he just stops and looks at me. He goes, let me just see if I understand what's happening here. Is he going to clown school as well as medical school? Is Ehrlich now uh, in a clown academy? Because you have him in a clown shirt. Is that what you had in mind, a clown shirt? Bob Moore says, because Bruce Paltrow is a very powerful man at this point. He's done White Shadow for successful, a successful couple of seasons, and he's the executive producer of the top dog on this show, St. Elsewhere. And so when he's upset, everybody knows about it, and everybody was very concerned if Bruce liked them or hated them. And right away, it's my first meeting. He was not there somehow when I read for Dr. Peter White and didn't get it, but he's there now. And so I say, hi, Mr. Paltrow, Ed Begley. And I say, I know who you are. Nice to meet you. He says, trying to, he's trying not to be rude, but he said, I hate it. Mark takeaways in, Bruce, Bruce, give it, just, let's just think about it a while. I think it works. And Masha says, I like it a lot. It's funny and in a good way. So he says, fine. Bruce Paltrow goes, fine, you know what? Do it any way you want. You can see, Ed, welcome to the show. You can see the way they treat me around here. They spit my face, and then they uh, act like they don't even care about my opinion. Good luck to you all. And he goes back to his office. I went, oh, my God. I'm going to be fired before I even shoot a scene. He hates me, hates the wardrobe. Bob Moore was told to keep the wardrobe of the Hawaiian shirt. It proved to be a very good choice. It really enhanced the character of the thing. Bruce Paltrow, the man who hated me at first, didn't hate me at all, ever. That's just the way he loved talking to people. He became my greatest friend and ally to when he passed. And we hung out when we shot the show, years after we shot the show. He was my greatest uh, ally in the creative process of the show. I got very lucky when I met Bruce Paltrow. Very, very cool. And so St. Elsewhere, just another note on St. Elsewhere, since I told you I need to stay there for a minute, is all of these actors together before they had gone on to do other things too. A lot of a lot of big names in that show. Big names. Ray Liotta is one of the first things he did was an episode of our first thing of note. He'd done many, you know, plays and things and other, you know, things that uh, Robert Davi, uh, 
my God, Denzel Washington was a regular on the show, and he was clearly a brilliant, brilliant actor and really got recognized during St. Elsewhere for that. And Bruce Paltrow, and Denzel, to his wonderful credit, gave Bruce a, the acknowledgement for this. Bruce Paltrow let him out of his contract for a few episodes so that he could do glory, so he, he could do you know, Cry Freedom and do these wonderful movies That's while he was cool. supposed to be doing St. Elsewhere. Yep. We didn't always come back on time for our, you know, starting to do the fall episode. Some of us were running late from a movie or something we were doing, and Bruce would always try to work it out. Very generous man. He act tough, but he was anything but. He was one of the sweetest guys, the most generous guys I ever worked with, and he really made me a TV star, and I've worked ever since from that day that I met him. Mm -hmm. never had any problem getting work. Yeah, it really is like some people can make such a difference. I don't even know if they know what a difference. I mean, I guess he would know what a difference he made for you, know, for, you for Denzel Washington, for others. But it is amazing what people are, how much impact people can have on others just by small little decisions. Gave so many guys a shot at directing. Eric Lonneville, uh, Thomas Carter. Um, all these wonderful actors that worked on White Shadow gave them all mm. uh, a shot at directing. We had a lot of diversity in the cast, too. We had Alfre Woodard, who was brilliant in the show. We had all these incredible people. I just, I feel blessed to have worked with them all those years. And yeah, the best writers, Alfre Tom Woodard Fontana, yeah. Channing Gibson, Chick Egley, uh, just amazing writers. So, um, side note about wardrobe, when I started to read your story about it, it reminded me of something that someone I think you know once told me. Patrick Fabian. I love Patrick Fabian, by the way. Is he great? He's so do I. He's fantastic. He is what a great guy. So I love that man. Right. So tell me what you why you love that man, because I think it would be nice for him to hear that. Well, I worked on Better Call Saul. I'd have an episode here or there. But the kindness that he extended to me, you know, he's a regular. I'm in and out for sometimes just one episode a whole season, sometimes none. It was an episode, or, uh, a season or two in which I had no episodes. He welcomed me each time with a friendship and a camaraderie and, a, and assistance, you know, with various things. I'm a good deal older than him and starting to slow down physically in many ways because of a number of things, some of which I write about in the book. And so he just helped me in ways you can't imagine. The most generous guy ever. And not just to me, to everybody. He's just an amazing, amazing guy. If everybody was like him on every show, we would have no problem shooting anything. He's just, I wouldn't restrict it to show business. He's a guy that everyone should emulate. I, I really adore that man. I agree. That's Patrick for sure. That yep. sounds exactly like Patrick. And I agree that we need more Patricks in the world. We sure do. So he told me a story once about wardrobe that, so many things can change after you're offered a job as an actor, but once you go in for wardrobe, that's it. You know it's going to happen. So yep, that is true. like the thing that it he's like, oh, when I get the phone call for wardrobe, then I know then it's, it's going to happen. Real. Yep. And it actually holds up in different things where there's been some arbitration about, well, we, he hadn't really started working on the movie as an actor, so that's why we terminated him. We didn't give him any residuals or the pay for the thing. Uh, well, hold on. Didn't he go have a wardrobe fitting? He did? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, you know, really? A, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, wardrobe fitting makes it very official. Oh, okay. Showing okay. up on the set for the first day of shooting also makes it official. Sometimes they go, we've got to change that character. We didn't like whatever the way he looked in the wardrobe or whatever. We, we didn't think he looked like that, whatever they attempt to do. If you go for the wardrobe fitting, it's the same as showing up to shoot. You have worked on the movie and need to be paid whatever has been agreed upon. And uh, you can't just let them go without cause. Got it, got it. So Better Call Saul was a great, I mean, that was such a such oh, an boy. amazing series. So great, loved it. So you were happy to be part of that, I guess. Very much so. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd seen Breaking Bad, one of the best television shows in the history of TV. You know, there was back in my father's day, it, there was so much great television. Pat Echevsky would write the thing and Sidney Lumet would direct it and incredible writers. Rod Serling wrote patterns that my father did as a teleplay then as a movie great writers, it was considered the golden age of television. And I think that's true. I think it was the golden age of television. This is now the platinum mm. age of television with what Vince Gilligan and Peter Gould are doing, not once but twice, you know, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul and, you know, Handmaid's Tale and all of that. It's just, it's amazing the television that's going on today. It's just extraordinary. The Bear is incredible. 
Think of the shows that are on now, so original, so like nothing you've ever seen before. Uh, Ozark was a great show. There's so many, I can't think of them offhand, but yeah. just shows that have been life-changing, just really incredible, incredible work. It's good, better than most features I've worked on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the quality is really pretty incredible at this yep. point. Um, I think that, I may be wrong in my facts, but I think Vince Gilligan is working on a new series, well, not right now, but with Ray Seahorn from Better Call Saul. I've heard uh, rumors right? to that effect myself so. when the strike is over that that might occur. I would sure like to see her in another show. I'm a big, big fan of Ray Seahorn. She's amazing, too. She should be everywhere. She should be. She's the best of the best. Uh-huh. The two of them. Her and then and maybe you can get in there, too, on the new uh, series. I'll, I'll try and worm my way in. I think you should. Well, look, you're that. You're Forrest Gump. You can be here, there, and everywhere. That's right. So why wouldn't you be on set why of that? Why wouldn't I? Exactly. That right? makes Hell, perfect sense. I'll do sense. craft service on their show. Exactly, exactly. You can go in for whatever reason. Yeah. So, all right, let's get back for a second to the story about the... Well, before we go to the story about the garbage can... I need to talk a little bit about Marlon Brando. Sure. And Jack Nicholson. Because you had friendships with these people. Like, it wasn't just like you just happened to meet them for a minute like Forrest Gump. You had these friendships where you would see them over and over again. And they were interesting friendships. So you were friends with Jack Nicholson first, right? And he lived next door to Marlon Brando? Am I getting that right? That's correct. They lived next door to Marlon has passed, of course, but they lived no, next door to each other for many, many years. Do you talk to Jack still? I do have the good fortune to speak to him on a fairly regular basis. I mean, That's amazing. You know, one, a couple of times a year being a fairly regular basis, and I'm happy with whatever time he affords me. He's... Uh, a great friend, a, a great actor, a great man. He's been so generous with me, I don't know how to, to quantify it. But again, people have been so generous with you. What they do have. you think that is about? I have no idea, but I don't want them to figure it out. You better not tell them in this show. <laughs> don't expose me for the fraud I am. I swear to God, I'm going to be very upset with you. I mean, you've mentioned it over and over again that you're a fraud, right? But everybody has all this goodwill towards you. So what do you... What, what do you there are good con men and the people who are not so good at it. I've got them all fooled. <laughs> my wife will tell you. Talk to Rochelle, my wife, about it. She'll tell you what it really is. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, it's a lot of fooling you're doing then. A lot. A lot well, of, uh, you know, I did. I had a thought actually that that this reminds me of while I was reading the book, which is, you, have lied very easily in your life. A lot. I did. I was a very good a lot liar. Of lies. Because of, uh, early on, I was a bad liar. I, I didn't quite get some key, you know, believability factors about it to really, it's got to be somewhat believable. But if, but having said that, if you make it just a little bit weird, it, it becomes, again, more believable. I can't believe what happened. What happened? You got stuck in traffic? No, no. Somebody stole my battery. Can you believe it? Somebody jacked open the hood and stole my battery. This is before I was driving electric cars, you know. Mm -hmm. It was so wild that... They, someone stole your battery. Wow. People, everybody believed it, you know, because it was just too, who would make up a story about someone stealing their battery? It's just too far afield. Yeah. And that was the it's thing. like that the more bizarre it is, if the you more get believable. Too, if you're too drunk or too, you're not thinking, you had too many details, then right away it's like, oh, okay, too many details. This is all baloney. You can't go that far, but one little twist of a good detail, it, was a, it would be a great lie and it could usually hold up. Okay, so why all the lies besides to get yourself out of trouble? Um, I was so amazed that my father pulled off that lie about who my mother was. I just, I guess, I wanted to see if I could do it. So it was an acting though, exercise. Do you think that it has something to do with that? It might have, but I, I the good news is I stopped doing it in nineteen uh, in nineteen seventy nine when I got sober. Mostly stopped doing it. I stopped doing it with sobriety with, you know, who paid the check or whatever, anything you could imagine except one minor detail. I was allowed to lie to half the population of the planet known as women. That was still kind of allowed for their own good, you know, not to tell the truth about, Ed, why is your hair wet? My hair. I went into, I was dropped by Harry Dean's and I jumped in the sauna with him. That's why my hair, no, my hair was wet because of the shower and why did I take a shower? One can only imagine. Mm-hmm. So that's the kind of stuff I still did through the late 80s, early 90s. I did it rarely after, let's say, 1990. 
and uh, and certainly stopped doing it by like 93 or something like that. I, I don't think I've told a lie about anything from a traffic light to a, a, a dalliance. I haven't, I haven't had any extracurricular activities for quite a few years. I've been with one woman and one only, so it's much easier to keep your story straight when you're telling the truth. Mm-hmm. The truth is the easiest thing to remember. Right. No lies since 1993? No. Uh, 1994, my wife didn't. <laughs> you, you see, you ask a good questions, and I certainly don't want to lie sitting here. So the truth is, in 1995, I was doing a play in Boston, a David Mamet play, and this very attractive young lady came to visit me in Boston to see the play, to see rehearsal or something from Germany. She came all the way from Germany to visit me, and she stayed with me. But there was, and this is the truth now, too, uh, there was no no amorous activities of any sort. She just came, and she stayed there with me for a few days and went home. Nothing happened. So because nothing happened, I thought it was okay to tell my then-girlfriend, soon-to-be soon be wife in 2000, this, well, five years later, my wife, but mother of my child in 1999, it was okay to tell her a lie about why I hadn't called back. I couldn't call back because that young lady from Germany was there at the apartment where I was, you know, staying while doing this play in Boston. And so I told my wife the reason I couldn't, uh, I couldn't, I didn't get her message because the cat walked on the answering machine. She knew I had a cat. She knew I'd brought an answering machine with me so I'd have a place to collect the calls. But I told her that the cat had walked on the answering machine. So Rochelle has got a good nose for baloney, my my wife and then my girlfriend. The first thing she did when she came to Boston to see the play was she walked in the bedroom and looked at the answering machine. The erase all button was not on the top of the answering machine. It was on the side. So how could a cat walking on the answering machine hit the button to erase all? Okay. So that was the last lie. <laughs> that was the last lie I think I've told to anybody. That was 19... Uh, that was, yeah, 1995. Okay, so for real, when you are considering lying about something, do you actually stop yourself and say, wait, I no longer lie? I didn't even think about lying. In fact, now it's so, it's such a pain in the ass to have a conversation with me. Yeah, so what happened, What like I just did, that was 94, no, no, it was 95, right. I have to stop. You don't care if it was 94 or 95, I could leave it that way, but it isn't true. It was the year after 94, it was 95, because I have these bookmarks in my head. Yeah. I know when things happened, most important things, and I can do that. So I tell a level of detail that is all true, but people really don't want to, it's too many details just because I don't want to lie. Oh, I just said it was that, it was really this. People don't give a shit. You know, they just want to finish up your story, right. and I don't need to, I don't care if it's 94 or 5. Okay, so why did you decide no more lying? Because it's, too hard to remember. I was starting to get older and I realized I couldn't remember as well what lie you told to who. You couldn't keep track of it. Too hard. The truth is a, is the best story. It really is always the best story because it's the easiest one to remember. So it's as simple as that? Nothing else happened at that one juncture? No. Uh, it, it's, it's the easiest to remember and it's the least painful for anybody. I don't have any pain for having told the wrong thing that somebody makes a decision based on something that is untrue. Why do all that? Here's what's really happening. I really didn't read your book. You know, I said I'd read it. I skimmed it. And so that's why I didn't know anything about the blah, blah, blah. You know, maybe somebody wants to hear that. Maybe they don't. But sometimes in the right situation, that's the right thing to do. Sometimes it's best to just say, well, I'm not sure. I can't really remember how much of it I read, but I think I read a lot of it. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it's best to tell the truth in most situations. Sometimes you don't need to give every detail when it could be hurtful to someone. Let's say you don't need to do it. But if you do, somebody says, no, I really need to know. You tell me right now because I'm asking you point blank. Did you read every page of the book? People are going to say whatever they say. Uh-huh. But So are you uh, good at detecting lies? Uh, no, I'm not as good as I used to because I have glaucoma. I can't see as well as I used uh, to okay, to see that okay. little tell, that little tick. Uh huh. And I really, it usually doesn't matter if somebody's lying to me or not. It's what they want me to know right now is that story that turns out I later learned was untrue. Did they forget? I give people wide, wide berth with benefit of the doubt. Maybe they didn't remember. Maybe they thought they had actually done X, Y, and Z. 
but it's, this is what they're saying now, and this is verifiably true because I'm standing here and the car is pulled up at the time specified, so that must have been true what they told me, the most recent thing they told me. So, okay, let's get in the car and go. Everything's fine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So do you think I really read your book? I know you read it. Excellent. How do you know? The way that you said it and the detail that you've had thus far, I know you read all of it. Okay, okay. So, but I don't, people who haven't read it, and I can tell by the way they're kind of phrasing things, I don't call them on it, certainly. What, what's the future in that? Right, right. Nice enough to them to try to read some of it. I'm a very much glass half full guy. Glass has to be just to have a few drops in it, and I'm satisfied. Yeah, see, this is all, I, I find this all very interesting that you have so many different aspects of yourself that aren't necessarily you wouldn't you wouldn't think they would belong together so you're a an optimist you're saying i am but you also had a big drug problem yeah and you played the victim to yourself yeah so do you see what i'm saying about this doesn't all that doesn't add up and i not that it doesn't add up that i don't believe you but it's an interesting uh, what's the what's the word I'm looking for? Dichotomy. Dichotomy. That's the word. Yeah. It's an interesting. There are many dichotomies going on. Probably. So, and again, and I don't want to give away the ending of your book either, but you, ha- I really appreciated the way that you ended it too, because you, and we'll talk about this too, if you don't mind. You talk about how is it okay to spoil the ending, kind of? Yes, you can do that. It's fine. So you have Parkinson's. I do. I hid it for years. I didn't even know I had it for. 12 years, uh, from 2004 to 2016, I knew something was up. Wow, I guess I'm getting old quicker than I thought. I can't quite ride my bike. It's not as easy to ride up to Mulholland and down around Franklin Canyon Lake. But I'm getting older, okay. Wow, I'm really stiff getting up from that table. Wow, okay. Uh, I guess I'm just getting older. Then after 12 years of that, 2016, I went to a speech therapist because I was starting to slur my words, as I find myself doing even a bit today. I'm not as articulate. I'm not enunciating the way I used to be able to really clearly, clearly. And so I went to the speech therapist. After the first session with her, she called up my doctor and said, do you know that your patient has Parkinson? Does he know? And do you know that? Because it's not on his chart. And my doctor said, no, I did not know that. But that solves some mysteries. About 2004, we had all we did all kinds of tests because it seemed like I had a brain lesion from everything that was happening then. It was not a brain lesion, so we and I wasn't twitching at the time. I wasn't doing that what they call pilling, like one would try to hold a pill. I'm manufacturing the the thing right now by trying to touch and wiggle my thumb and forefinger. That's what pilling, and I started doing that occasionally, but didn't report it to my doctor in 2004 because it wasn't happening. Mm-hmm. It happened a year before, six months before. It happened a few months afterwards. But I didn't report that. I thought that was just, I don't know what that was. But that was the Rosetta Stone to solve the hieroglyphics, the whole thing. Uh-huh. And she figured it out after one, because she had a lot of Parkinson's patients. Then I later learned my cousin also, after I left his birthday party years ago, like 10, 12 years ago, left his birthday party, his very high-end neurologist friend said, how long has your cousin had Parkinson's? And he said, my cousin doesn't have Parkinson's. He would tell me that. No, he does because if he holds his hand this way, he's dragging his left foot. Hmm. It was all there like we spoke about a moment ago. Bruce Willis, Bruce Willis was dead all along in The Sixth Sense and Rosebud was a sled. It was there in the first frame. Like David, Dave Mamet writes famously in his book about writing, you realize that it was there all along. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. My son and I were watching Only Murders in the Building. Do you watch that? I haven't seen it, but I got to see it. I love those two guys. Oh, you're going to love them even more in this. Yeah. They're so good. And with Selena Gomez, the trio, they're I love her, fabulous. too. She's wonderful. I got to see that. Thanks for reminding Please me. Please do. That's a do it tonight thing. Yeah, Thank do you. it tonight. And in fact, we're re-watching it now. So season three just ended. So we're missing it so much that we started with season one again. And I don't re-watch things often. We're re-watching this, and it's absolutely, it's a pleasure. My point was, what was my point? Oh, oh I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but one of the endings it was there from the beginning. That's it was right. that exact thing. And I was, I was, I don't know if it's, you would call it the same thing as Chekhov's gun, but that's kind of what I was teaching my son. It's like if the gun shows up in act one, it's going to go off in act three. Exactly. Interesting. So, um, okay, let me go back to what we were talking about though, which is, okay, so when you found out it's Parkinson's, how did you, did you feel sorry for yourself? Did you feel like a victim? I came, we, I was at a restaurant. I called up 
A doctor said, give me a call. I need to talk to you. And he gave me the news. I was out at a restaurant called Hugo's in the Valley. We go to a lot. I sat there with Dabney Coleman's son, who had just come by coincidence to have dinner with us that night, told him the news and my wife the news and my daughter. So, but, you know, I've heard this is, of all the times to get Parkinson's, this is a, a, a good time because the, how, the cavalry is coming soon, everyone thinks. This was 2016, a few years ago. The cavalry isn't entirely here yet, but I think they're starting to assemble. Mm, mm-hmm. And so I told her that and painted a nice, uh, put a nice picture on it as best I could. But I went home and I thought, I hope and pray I have just at least three years like my friend Bob Hoskins had. The wonderful actor Bob Hoskins had Parkinson's, and it was three years from diagnosis to death. From the same call I just got, Bob, you have Parkinson's, to goodbye, Bob, with three years. I went, will I get a full three? Hmm. I thought that was it. <clears throat> There's a, a, a Don Henley song, I Will Not Go Quietly, <clears throat> pardon me, and Rochelle, my wife, wouldn't go quietly. Uh, I did all the, <clears throat> pardon me, I did all the, my throat tightens up sometimes from Parkinson's. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I did all the carbidopa, levodopa, neurologist stuff. It works very well. Gave me some relief right away. Then for extra credit, she found glutathione, hyperbaric chamber, NAD, stem cells, did all that stuff. I'm now doing <clears throat> better than any of my friends are doing who've had it as long or longer, or, or longer or shorter. I'm doing very, very good. This is what it can look like. Uh-huh. Let me get under here so you can see yeah. how much twitching there is. Uh, I don't see any, really. I'm not really. seeing any twitching at all. No. very. I could pass. I'm holding my hands out straight like a sobriety checkpoint kind of a thing. Right. And I think I could pass a sobriety And this checkpoint. is most days for you are like this? What's that? Mo- are most days of the week like this for you? It's very rare that I twitch at all. That's wow. mostly from the carbidopa levodopa. That's what neurologists recommend, and it's a good drug, and it works. It has side effects, and you have to use more of it every year that goes by. Not every year, but every two or three years. Uh-huh. You've got to bump it up a little bit. It eventually gets a lot. That Then the medication has effects on you that are not entirely great, but it works very well. But the combination of that, doing what the neurologist, AMA, wonderful doctors tell you to do, mm-hmm. and then doing glutathione. Oh, let me put all this. I'll tell about the meds in a moment. Yeah, yeah. Vigorous exercise every day. I exercise every day. I go to the, the Nautilus Plus. I do the whole upper body circuit. Uh, Nautilus Plus. I'm living in the past. L.A. Wow, that's a flash from the past. Okay. I don't know you, what Nautilus Plus you, is. No, because it stopped being a, a place to go to okay. exercise in 1985. Okay. That's why you don't know about <laughs> it. But I go to L.A. Fitness. My wife got me the membership. That's why I don't know much about it. Okay. So, so now that you're mentioning you go to LA Fitness, are like is will people show up and, and go want to work out with you? I feel like they will. Come over people mostly very much respect your privacy at a club like that. Okay. Any gym usually they're pretty good. People come ho- up and say hello in a very nice way. They're fans there, but very respectfully. But I go there and I do the upper body circuit, the whole circuit, every machine that has to do with upper body, I do that. Then I do thirty minutes up to level twelve or fourteen on the uh, recumbent bike, which is good for your back. It doesn't hurt your back yeah, or anything. Yeah. And I do that for 30 full minutes, and I get a nice sweat out of that. This is every day you do this? I do it. It's rare that I miss. I haven't been today yet, but I will go later today because I had a lot of appointments today. Uh-huh. It's very rare that I miss. So I always do it. And if I'm somewhere out of town, they don't have a gym at the hotel I'm staying at, I do those push-ups in the room. I do exercises in the room because with this disease, it's use it or lose it. So exercise is number one after the good meds they give you. And then the next would be NAD, glutathione, hyperbaric chamber, oxygen-rich hyperbaric, and then uh, also stem cells, if you can get to them. Okay, so it's Parkinson's is progressive. It so is. do does this all kind of slow the progression? It slows it down a great deal. Okay, so it helps with symptoms and, and slows, it slows progression. It way down. That's pretty good. I'll take that deal. Yeah. I learned that I had it by two separate top doctors, neurologists. They both c- confirmed that I had it. There's no doubt about it. Does he have it? Doesn't mm-hmm. it? Does he not? I definitely had it. 2016. This is 2023, isn't it? That's seven years later. Yeah. Because it happened in August of 16. Seven years plus, and I'm doing this this well. I feel like I've got bonus years already. Y- yeah. I feel very lucky. 
Yeah, yeah. And there's that. Again, it's optimist and you have a lot of gratitude, it seems like. Yeah. I'm an optimist fully, so I would say I totally get that. And I, it doesn't seem strange to me that you know, somebody just is automatically an optimist. Um, I think there is good in, in everything. And you I can, think so, too. And, and it's also, though, it's use it or lose it similar to what you were saying, is that if you practice that kind of perspective on things, you'll have it more as well. I agree. Yeah. So you, you start looking at things like that and seeing the, the good and, and the reason why, oh, this is okay because, you know, this is a good thing because, and it kind of goes back to even that St. Elsewhere part that you didn't get. Right. So, you know, but the more that you look at things like that, the more you do start looking or look more at things like that. It's true. So, um, okay. So, and that, again, I was going to spoil the ending even more because... That like the final line, the last line of the book, I think it was, or the last paragraph, was that like even with everything going on physically, you, your life is sublime. It is. It's quite sublime. I have children, three wonderful children, three wonderful grandchildren. I'm blessed beyond measure, and I, I just feel grateful for every day. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to talk about the environment for sure. Yep. I mean, we don't need to discuss the environment per se, but I would like to talk about some of the ways that you've been involved in trying to make it better. Thank you. So, I mean, you were one of the the trailblazers. We were driving around your golf cart type vehicle for a while. That had a, you had a nice story about Cindy Williams in the right. book about that yes. driving her, picking her up on a date, definitely, and basically, an she, electric... there was not a second date after. It uh-huh. was not exactly a babe magnet. <laughs> but you did become friends. Say again. You did oh, become we did. friends. Cindy and I became very good friends. She sadly passed away about a year ago now, and I see her daughter Emily uh, since she passed, and uh, I love her and love her family still, and. Uh, she was uh, like a sister to me, godmother to my daughter, Amanda, and just a great person, a great actress, a great film actress, too. People remember her from Laverne and Shirley, but she was in Francis Ford Coppola's The Conversation. The Conversation, by the way, is a film to see if you haven't seen it to anybody Great listening. movie. Great, great movie. Great movie. Yeah. And um, what was the actor's name who was in The Godfather? He was only in like four movies. Uh no, was that his name? John, John Cazale. Yes. He was in that so Brilliant good. Actor, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Gene Hackman. Gene Hackman. Alan Garfield. Do you know Gene Hackman? I don't remember. Gene Hackman is definitely, yeah, he's the star of the movie, really. Do you know him, meaning personally? Is I he, never met him. There's he, one well, I haven't what, met. What are the see? odds of that? Slim to I none. I got to get it going here and meet Slime. Gene Hackman. That's right. Uh, Fred Forrest was in it. Um, I got Harrison Ford had a small part in it. Did you know Harrison Ford was in E.T., or his voice was? I didn't know that. Yeah, fun fact, it was a scene in the school where Elliot, you do know E.T., right? Oh, very well. Okay. Elliot was in school, and I think they were about to dissect the frogs. Oh, yeah. And then they were letting them loose, and the teacher, the voice of the teacher was Harrison Ford. I didn't know yeah. that. That's very cool. Fun fact. I'll listen for that. So getting back to the environment, you also had the show, um, you had the TV show. Yeah, my wife and I had a show, and I had a show, <clears throat> pardon me, called Living with Ed for three seasons, two on Home and Garden and one on Planet Green. Yeah, my <clears throat> uh, kids and my husband used to watch it, I remember. It was a fun show. It was a fun show. They liked it. So, okay, so you really do represent, like you are one of the main people, I would say, who authentically and for a long time represent the environment, doing the right thing. I've been doing my personal action stuff for a long time, and that's important. But I found I need to clarify as years go by how we really cleaned up the air in L.A. Personal action, me doing what I did, had a lot to do with it. But there's got to be three legs to the tripod or it's going to fall over. It won't support good three legs to the table you're going to formulate good environmental legislation on. And one is personal action, very important. Corporate responsibility, to have companies that are going to make energy-efficient light bulbs or electric cars or solar panels. And the third one is good legislation. We have four times the cars in L.A. and millions more people, yet a fraction of the smog. That is because all three of those things, personal action, Mm -hmm. going down the airboard and talking about, you know, the cars that I drive and others that are available, 
corporate responsibility. People started to make cleaner cars and make cleaner power plants, make cleaner internal combustion cars with catalytic converters, you know, to do that kind of stuff back in the 70s. That's how we got there. And, uh, and of course, uh, the, yeah, the Clean Air Act is what gave us the cudgel, the enforcement possibility to really get them to clean up the air. It took all three. You can't do it with one or two. Personal action, people buying energy efficient bulbs is wonderful, but it's not going to solve the problem. Uh-huh. You need all three. You won't, you won't get anything done. Four times the cars, millions more people, but a fraction of the smog. We did that with all three things. Got it. Okay. So what is the smog situation now in L.A.? Much improved for most of us. The vast majority, <clears throat> pardon me, it's much improved for most of us. The vast majority of us breathe cleaner air, but the people who still have dirty air, those people who live near the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles, they're in San Pedro, and the people who live near shipping centers, fulfillment centers, and what have you, those people, freeway interchanges, there's a lot of smog around those isolated areas now. None of it's isolated. It's mm-hmm. not like it's cordoned off, you know, and sealed off by a dome or what have you. It is, it air moves around, but there's a concentration of those uh you know, particulate matter and other things and nitrogen ox- nitrous oxide and all of it around those shipping centers. All right, let's go back to you and analyzing you because I should tell you that I am a therapist also. I didn't know that. Wonderful. So it's my pleasure to analyze exactly who you are and what you've been, how you've coped with life. It's my pleasure to be analyzed by someone as engaging as you. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I do think I will analyze you a little bit and say that I think that I have solved the question that I asked before, which is why so many people have uh, been so gracious to you. I think it's because there is an authenticity underneath all the lies and everything else. There's a sincerity about you that comes across just naturally. That's very sweet. What What do you think about that? I like that theory. I hope it's true. I think it might be true. I'm going to embrace it. You like people. I do. Not a lot of people. I think people are basically good. I don't think a lot of people think that way. I think you're right. And we're optimists and we think that. I do think that and I think it's true. I've been all over this country and I know we disagree about many things, but there's a heart and there's a kindness too in the country for these people that are thought to be on the other side of things for me, but they're, they they act like wonderful people in many ways because they are wonderful. They're very kind and generous in many ways and will save your neck in a pinch. So uh, I think we have to factor that in when we talk about important issues that we're posed on. You know, I'm not saying anybody should stop thinking what they think. People should have their belief system and act on it. But uh, we we all need to understand that we need each other. Mm-hmm. What do people get wrong about you? What do they assume about you that's not accurate? That's a good question. Oh, probably, yes, I know the answer to that very well. People think I'm in much better physical shape than I actually am because I was for so long in great physical shape. But two thousand, about 2018, that started to change after a few years, knowing that I had Parkinson's. I didn't get depressed about it. I didn't let down my guard and stop exercising, but I could see with all that I was doing, there's still some other stuff that just kind of creeping along at a slow pace that Mm. made things different. Not unlivable, not impossible, not torturous, just different. So I can't. And then also I wound up losing a good deal of my hearing. So that changes an evening out conversing with friends and glaucoma on top of it. So I'm kind of, I have trouble seeing, hearing, and feeling because of the Parkinson's. Other than that, I'm just fine. You have definitely turned around that victim mode in your life. I have. Yes, definitely. It is a 180 from where you started. Yeah. It's all a gift. And part of it is knowing that I I lived to be 74 so far. I had a birthday September 16th. I'm 74. I never thought I'd live to be 60-something for good reason. The way I drank and used drugs, I thought I'd that would happen. For years, I thought an earthquake was going to hit California, was going to fall in the sea. I did not understand plate tectonics, nor geology, obviously. L.A. can't fall in the sea. It'll eventually meet up, you know, part of the coast will meet up with the Aleutian Islands because of the way the plates are shifting, but that'll take, you know, 
hundreds of thousands of years, I think, for that to occur, but it's not going to fall in the sea. And I, I thought that I thought the nuclear bomb was going to drop. I thought the earthquake, and then I thought, and this was the one most accurate of all. I'm probably going to die from drugs and alcohol, either driving or just from what I've ingested. And that was an odds-on favorite for most of my friends. Mm. You've come a long way, Ed. Yes, I have. If there is one thing that you want people to remember you as or by or something you want people to know about you and some legacy you want to leave, what is it? Don't just do something. Stand there. Okay, wait. I'm trying to figure out what you mean by that. Don't just do something. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Stand Uh, there. I've been my uh, my whole life so busy running around from pillar to post trying to save the owls, save the whales, clean up the air, do this, all worthy things to do. And I want to do them and I still can do them. But you have to make sure you have your quiet time and don't run around the whole time frantic and upset and angry at people because you want to save anything. Don't do anything for a while. Get serene, get your center. Then you'll be more empowered to do more work. Do two things well rather than 14 things badly. Yeah, I'll, I'll be part of your environmental board. Yeah, I'll be part of that one too. And I'll do the other one. I'll, I'll mail letters on Wednesday. And I'll come by Thursday and I'll make the picket signs. And we'll do the this and we'll do that. All wonderful things. But don't do more than you can do. We shouldn't be lackadaisical about it. Mm-hmm. We have climate change to deal with. We can't also just do nothing, be lazy. But I don't need that note at all. The note I need to hear is don't just do something. Stand there. Get centered. Get some measure of serenity in your life, then go do. You'll do much better that way. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. I really appreciate this talk. Me too, Kara. I wish you all the best. And to you. Okay, so that's Ed Begley. The dead body in the trash can story, I know we never got to it. I am sorry about that. But it is in Ed's memoir, which you can get at my Amazon shop. Just click on the link in today's show notes. And by the way, Ed has a line of eco-friendly products called Begley's Earth Responsible Products. You can get those on my Amazon shop as well. I'm Kara. Thanks for hanging out with Ed and me. Before we close today's episode, let's do the fun little chat with all those behind the scenes voice factoids with Tim from Soundbox. Tim. Yes. It's so great to be here. <laughs> this is one of my favorite places like in the universe. <laughs> Thank I, you. I come mm-hmm. here to tape my show a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Really famous and I love it and yep. I bring my guests in and they're they're welcome so warmly and you give me a great product at the end of Thanks. it and Thank you. Thank you. So I'm happy to be here and thank you for all of this. Happy to have you. So okay, so we're at Soundbox LA. Yep. And that's Mm -hmm. your studio. My studio. Yep. And you own the studio Mm -hmm. and you have Mm -hmm. several locations. Yep. Yeah, we have two. We have Soundbox uh, Woodland Hills and Soundbox West Side. Mm -hmm. Um, And those are all kind of the same thing. They're they're just they're really you know very high quality home studios. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's that's what we have. So Mm -hmm. who comes in here besides me? (laughs) <laughs> Besides you, you know, one of our you know, one of the things we've done for a long time is we kind of specialize in high profile clients. We're a really tucked away place that's not listed publicly on you know on Google. You can if you search for us, it'll send you up the up the block, so you can't actually get here. So we've worked for a long time since twenty I mean since twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen or so with really high profile clients for kind of these same things on um, these podcasts. Um, and then we do a ton of video game work and a lot of um, ADR. We do uh, Chicago PD and some other ADR stuff. So that's when somebody has to come back in and pick up lines. And so instead of going back to to a set, they'll go into like a studio and pick up. They made a mistake on a line or they need to fix something in there. So we do that. Right. So um, let's talk about that for a second for the yeah. average person because yeah. I think I told you the story that mm-hmm. I was chatting with Tim Daly once, and mm. well, more than once, because he's on my show a lot. And this yeah. one time, he was just talking about looping, and he's like, "Oh, I have to go back for looping." Yeah. And I was like, "What's looping?" And he's like, "What? You don't know what looping yeah, yeah, is? Yeah. Oh, I forgot you're a civilian." <laughs> is what he said. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so he had to explain yeah. to me what looping is, which is mm. ADR. What you just said. So yeah. that is yeah. automatic dialogue replacement. Uh, automatic, yeah, automatic dialogue replacement. Um, and there are kind of two. There's kind of looping, and there's ADR. They're kind of similar but different. So like like a lot of loop groups. Like if you have, say, you have like a, a a movie with a with in a cafe. Everybody else, you would normally hear the sounds of the cafe and people talking in the background. When you record the scene on set, nobody else can talk because you wouldn't hear the actors. 
Mm-hmm. So what you do is you go back in and do ADR looping and you fill in all those background voices. So you'll see a scene, they'll loop the scene a few times and you'll pick out, okay, I'm going to be, I'm going to be that person over there talking to this person. And then you have to basically just improv and come up with a conversation, which is just bland of like, Hey, how you doing? Oh, good. All right. What, what are you doing today? Oh, well, I got to go to work today after work. And then, uh-huh. you know, then I'm gonna go to the gym and then I got to go home and walk the dog. And you know, what do you get today for coffee? Just like real, that ba- all the background chatter that you would normally hear. And then there's kind of, then there's ADR, um, where you actually go back in and either do a voice match or the celebrity will go back in or the actor will go back in and fix a line. Either they, they flubbed it in, in the delivery or um, a lot of times if it's if it's shot outside, maybe you couldn't actually hear very well. The lav mic didn't work or you know the boom mic they had, so they'll go back in and fix. And sometimes they'll they need to change the line in a scene. The scene didn't the line doesn't work mm. or they have to there or they want to change. You can change change the course of a scene if you change a line in something. So you can do that as well. So a lot of times the uh, the actor will go back in and redo those lines. A lot of times there's a voice match because you can't, you're not going to have hire Brad Pitt to come back in and say a couple of words. You'll hire somebody who sounds like Brad Pitt to go in and change, Very fix a couple of those words. So there's a strong possibility that if you don't see somebody's mouth on camera, an actor's mouth on camera, you may not actually be hearing their voice. Uh-huh. Could be hearing, you could be hearing a voice match or a dialogue dialogue that they went back in and, and recorded later. And you can hear that sometimes in like older movies where for some reason like one sentence just sounds really weird. Yeah, I uh, yeah. definitely yep. witnessed that. Yeah, that's an overdub. They went back in and fixed that line afterwards and they watched themselves on camera and matched matched the line they said. Or they had to change the line, or yeah, something just sounds weird. It's it's the, you know it's so much better now than than it used to be. But every once in a while, you pick up like one word or something that was, mm-hmm. especially during during any things that were shot during COVID. A lot of times you have you could hear some things that were recorded in studio beforehand, and then they had to pick up a line from somebody's home afterwards, <laughs> oh, <awkward>. right? <laughs> so because <laughs> right. you had to do what you had to do, right? So anyway, so that's that's the long version of of all of that. So. Okay, yeah. and you have been mm. one of those people, or you can be mm. one of those actors, the voice yeah. actors who comes in and does a line. It's a voice match, you called yeah. it? This is called a voice match, yeah. Right, yeah. so I wonder yeah. if anybody can guess who yeah. you would be a voice match for. Well, you know, that's a good question. Like my mom and daddy used to always say, that's a riddle wrapped up inside a conundrum. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that is so perfectly Jason Sudeikis. I kind of can't <laughs> believe that you always have sounded like him. I just, I've always sounded like, yeah, yeah. I had no idea. I mean, it's one of those things like you... I just think I sound like myself, obviously. Everybody thinks they sound like themselves. But um, there's some people who specialize in voice match, um, and I don't. That's nothing I've ever really done. Um, but I did book – I booked a voice match um, and voice match for Jason Sudeikis in the new movie Blue Beetle. And I, I'm actually – I play a character in the movie. I'm, I'm Ted Cord at the end of the movie and actually have an entire scene. Um, so it's not really a voice match. It's more of like an ADR thing. It's like a loop, mm. loop thread because they, they had a digital, they said a di- digital image on the screen and I played the voice of the of the image on the screen. So you so. watch the digital image mm-hmm. and then your your mouth just kind of does it or your voice yeah, does they, it? Yeah, they, in, in this case, it's so, uh, the way that it's all, it's it's scrambled. It's like, it's a very distorted digital image. So you kind of see the, see the image moving and talking. Um, so I don't. I didn't have to do. Oh, okay. I didn't have to actually do match called lip, lip flaps. We call them lip flaps. Oh, a lot um, of technical terms. Yeah, here. It's crazy. Um, but we do it a lot in in dubbing. I do a lot of dubbing work as well, where you're you're dubbing the like the, you're replacing the Japanese language with English. Okay. So I do a lot of anime work where we where we replace the English or replace the Japanese with English. Um, so. Oh, okay. So you do that outside or you mm-hmm. do that here at the I, studio? I, I do it outside I, I do that as a voice actor in other studios oh, okay. so I go out and do that so um there's a big one I, the one I'm biggest one I'm on now is uh, in record of Ragnarok on Netflix okay. which is a, an anime anime dub on Netflix and so it's all originally was in Japanese and then the entire cast the whole show is then re-recorded in English it's it's localized so it's recorded in, in all the different languages um, so okay. that you can see it so you can see it localized so people aren't mm-hmm. so instead of watching it with subtitles mm-hmm. They can listen to or watch it dubbed. Yeah, yeah you can watch it. There's, there's a dub, a dub and a sub. So a dub, you know, dubbed with the with the actual language over it or subtitled. Oh, okay. Um, and a lot, a lot of people really prefer the sub. They like they'd like to hear the original Japanese performance and then read what it is that they're saying. Yeah, I so, mean that's interesting because I watch a lot of shows with subtitles because yeah, they're yeah. European or yeah, wherever yeah. Yep. they're from. Yep. And so um, I know though that there have been shows that I recommend to people, mm-hmm. yeah. and I have to always say like, "Are you okay with subtitles?" Yeah, and, yeah. 
Yeah. Plenty of people are not. Yeah. But that is an option that, I yeah. mean, I probably should give them that option too because there's this one, sh- or there are like two shows. One is Gamora, it's in mm-hmm. Italian. Okay. And another yeah. one is Borgen and it's okay. Danish. Yeah, okay. And they're like yeah, the yeah. greatest shows. Yeah, but yeah. there are people who will not watch because they have subtitles. But there is yeah. that option. Yeah. They can just. S- sometimes, not always. Sometimes there's a dub. Sometimes there's only a sub. So, yeah. okay. So tell me something about mm-hmm. also, because I know, I believe that I was here once a few years ago. This mm-hmm. is when. I had Jason Ritter on yeah. my show when mm-hmm. we came here. Yep. And I think that as I arrived, the voice of Porky Pig, I want to say, was leaving. Oh, Bob, Bob Bergen, yeah. Bob, Bob Bergen. Bergen. Yeah. Bob Bergen was probably leaving, yeah. Right, because yep, yep. I remember he did a little Porky Pig <laughs> yeah, voice, yeah, yeah. and he has a lot of those voices. Yep, 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 so yep. that's yeah. the other kind of thing that the yep. voice actors, they're, they're, Absol- are they yeah. very specifically, like he's a specifically mostly mm-hmm. a... Like an animated an, an, an animation, yeah. He'd be doing animation, um, but he does a lot of commercials as well. I mean, a lot of voice actors do everything. Um, you'll do a ton, you know. I mean, I I do most of what I do. I'm 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 specialized when I sound like this. I'm not a character voice, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not like I'm not Daffy Duck. I'm not Porky Pig. I'm not Donald Duck. I'm not Mickey Mouse. I'm not any of those things. I can't. I just can't do those voices. Um, Bob is one of those people who does everything. And he he'll, he can do narration. He can do the, the pork. He does porky pig. I think he's Tweety Tweety Bird as well. Um, you know, and various other right. other actors. You know, other characters in those things. But then he also does commercials and serious work that is you know narration or drama. Um, but it's everything. I mean, any, any place you hear a voice, it's a uh-huh. voice actor, right? Any place there's a voice training videos, um, e learning modules. You have all the COVID protocol that came out when HR, all the HR videos you have to watch. Yeah. If you're going out of company, right? That's all VO, the, you know, the announcements at the airport, any of those things. IVR, the interactive voice response systems that you talk to, you know, that say, yeah, hi, yeah, if you're calling so and so, dial, dial, dial one or whatever it is. Siri. Right? You know, Siri. Yeah. Siri is an A, Siri's AI. AI generated um, synthetic oh, voice. Okay. That would be a synthetic voice. Um, but it wasn't there a woman? Originally, Susan Bennett was the original. Oh, right. I believe it's Susan Bennett. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's yeah. who it is. Um, she was the original. She was the original voice of Siri, but it didn't know what it was that she was recording. Um, just went in and recorded a bunch That's of stuff. That's right. So yeah. she kind of got screwed over. Probably, yeah. So but, she went to record yeah. for like a phone system or something like that. I don't know exactly what it was she thought she was doing, but it was something that didn't exist. So it's very hard to put a value and a price and a, and knowledge on something mm. that doesn't exist yet. Had they been, you know, they could have been more forthright with her up front, but now you're talking about business business secrets and technological right. advances that you can't have a voice act. You know, voice actors are under, under NDAs. It's very strict. A lot of times you have to, you know, some places, you have studios, you have to leave your phone in a locker when you go inside. Mm. Um you know, because a lot of these game, you know, a lot of these projects, games take years to develop, and voice actors sometimes are working on projects for three or four years before they're even announced. Okay, so what um, so, is what's going on in the? What are they doing for three years with the voice recording? Act? Recording Just what? Recording. Um, this is you know could be it could be anything. It's fights. I mean, you know, these video games are so massive, right? They're some of these games are open world mm-hmm. games, meaning that you can go anywhere in the game. And so you have massive, massive storylines. And these games, people want to play them for, you know, 30, 40 hours. You need to have consistent right. gameplay. And there's side stories. They're, they're massive stories, right? They're massive movies. Imagine if you watched a movie but then could take any one of those scenes and let's follow this character over here and go do this one. So you have to have that possibility. And let's watch this scene. And now what happened if what happens if we don't walk through that mm. door in this scene? What happens if we do walk through the door? What happens if we decide to fight this person in this next scene but not in this next scene? And and you have just massive there's there's story arcs and there's sub stories and there's there's these 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 lines that go off in this direction with this sub character, you know, minor character over here or the main character that has worlds and worlds to get through. Um, and you have to record all of that. All okay, of so that. that comes in as different mm-hmm. scripts, I guess. Mm-hmm. Different... The, um, yeah, they, they actually, they're, they're giant Excel spreadsheets. Uh, and okay. you have your lines and you go down and you do your line, 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 line. And sometimes you have context and sometimes you don't. Um, so a lot of the times you, you, do, you, you do multiple takes of it. And, and uh... then when they put it together in the end, you know, you hopefully, or the, you know, the director, you have a director who knows the story and is able to know what the context is and to make sure that it's consistent with the character and where where you are in the scene. Um, but yeah, I mean, lots of it is, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of lines. It's a lucrative job, it can right? be, sometimes. I mean, sometimes. it feels like a really yeah. great job, that like a desirable mm. job. It's it's a desirable job. It's you know it's 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 a business. There's it's you you are a brand. You're mm-hmm. you're a you're a brand, and you have to sell yourself, and you have to market yourself. Um, everybody, you wake up every day unemployed. 
right? right? And you're trying to find trying to find work, and hopefully you'll have something that day. But most of you know most voice actors just work forty hours a week auditioning, you know, and yeah. and it's that it's that constant grind. And there's a lot of regular work that can be had, um, but you know with with changes in technology, there's a lot of the work that's going to go away. There's a lot of things that are disappearing, becomes more competitive. Um, I think that in, in, a, in a good way, I think that's going to um, raise the bar for those. You just have to be better in order to get booked. So I think we're going to see a lot of people who don't really put the effort in or don't really, who think it's an easy job, mm-hmm. who think it's just something I can buy, like a cheap microphone and just record in my living room. And that's all you need to make a, make six figures are finding out that's not true. We call it voice acting for a reason. Acting is number two, right? Voice is number one. If you don't have, if you don't have the right voice for the job, it doesn't matter how good your acting is. But if you have the great job, great voice for that job and you're a great actor, you're going to be, you're going to work, you know, you'll work a lot. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So yeah. advice for somebody who wants to become a voice actor, what would you tell them to do? <laughs> um, explore, train, coach, and believe people when they tell you that it's not easy and you won't make it big in the first year. Um, but there's a great big community out there, people who love to help other voice actors. Um, it is competitive. There are, if you go to some of the online casting sites, you're competing against a million other voice actors. Mm. Um, it is competitive and it's something that you have to really want to do. You have to really want to stand in a, in a padded room for eight hours a day talking to yourself. And if that's what you really enjoy doing, then this is the right career for you. And if it's not, then don't do it. There's many other great things out there to do. It's not a, a get, get rich quick scheme. Um, you're not going to make a lot of money right off the bat and probably won't make a lot of money for a while, if at all. Now what they're doing is quantity. They're taking, I'm going to, I'm going to take in 500 or a thousand auditions and I'll take my time to sift through them. Um, the, the pool is bigger. So, um, yes, definitely, you know, the sooner you can get it in the better. I think that that definitely happens a lot for booked work. Um, and if you work in promo or play, I do a lot of political work. So I work, you know, in the political campaigns, You've got like 15. what? What are you talking about? Um, oh, I, I, I do, I do, I do Senate like Senate Senate campaigns for Senate candidates, governors for commercials. Uh, for commercials, yeah. Oh. Um, I, I was um, last last year. I was in, I did the commercials for Raphael Warnock campaign in Georgia. Uh, I've done stuff for like the the Wisconsin Supreme Court that had their big thing happening earlier this year. Um, various governors, you know. So and so is great for the community. You should vote for this person. This person is bad. Don't vote for that person. <laughs> um, I do a lot of that stuff, but a lot of those have fifty minute turnaround times. Like you book it and you got 15 minutes to go in and record it and turn it in because a lot of times voiceover is the very last thing to go into a project. The whole thing's done. They have a temp voice. Now they put the voice in and something happened at nine o'clock. They have to record it at 11 and go to air at noon to counter what just happened in the morning. Oh, or they've right. got something that's, you know, they're, they're preparing. We, we have to get this commercial out before the five o'clock news. Or we know that somebody's going to make an announcement at seven o'clock tonight. So we got to have ours out by six. And so it moves that fast. Um, so it's, fa- stuff, it's so. really fascinating. I find this whole thing it's so interesting. I <laughs> yeah, really do. Like people don't know anything about this. Yeah, it's if you're not in the voice no. acting world. If you're not, and, and and that's part of what you know. One of the other things I do is advocacy group is 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 you know working alongside other voice actors to raise the profile of what voice acting is mm. within the industry because it is not just. Oh, it's not just acting. It's, oh, well, I, I can do on camera. I can just do this. I'll just, you know, so I'll do this in my spare time. It's a full-time job, and it is, it is a unique skill set. It is a unique um, industry. It's a unique business. It's unique, unique marketing. The jobs are very unique, and it, it operates in a way that most people aren't familiar with and aren't always comfortable working with this speed or this constant rejection, if you want to call it rejection. Mm-hmm. We call it selection over rejection. I've, I've done an, I've done enough casting that very rarely do you reject somebody, but you listen and you go, yeah, good, good. And then you go, yep, that's the one I want. That's so, so interesting. I love yeah. that. That it's, should apply also to it's, it's a lot of everything. things. It should apply to a lot of things. Selection versus rejection. It's almost always select. Every once in a while you go, oh, well, that, that voice is not, you know, like, well, that's not going to work for this game at all. Or this is going to be good for this casting, but most of the time you're like, if you know, if you do, if you're you're getting a good casting director or a good good pool of talent, you'll have 99 percent of people could very well do that job, and it's going okay. Well, this is great, but you know what? The music we have over here isn't going to work with that voice, so we have to go with this voice. Or as we've seen in multiple times, they like they pick a voice, and the music didn't work, so now they got rid of that music and replaced the music, and now they have two voices that work really well, but now those two voices don't work together, so now we have to replace this one voice actor. And this voice actor gets to stay, but this music has to go. And so a lot of times it's like 
it's everything's great, but they just don't work great together. And so you have to find different all, different ways of doing that. But we try and say selection, selection, not rejection, because ninety nine percent of the time it is just wow, that's really good, that's great, wow, that's great, that's great. And then you go, yep, that's the one we want. Or it's ten people that are like. All any one of these people would be great. Let's pick that one. Great, call them and let's book them. So, you know, and it's not it's not that they rejected the other nine people. It's that the other nine people were great for it. They just don't have nine spots. You know, that is so. a gem. I am so happy that you <laughs> shared that because that's something to share with everybody yeah. for yeah, like yeah. all reasons. Yeah, that is a gem. This whole talk was super insightful. Go. I'm excited to share it with people. So awesome. thank you for the, all of it. You're welcome. I'm Kara. Thanks for listening. This is Ed Begley, and I had a wonderful conversation with Kara. I suggest you listen in to my episode and many others. There's lots of wisdom there. Thank you, Kara, for a great time together.